in most of these cycles, negative growth means it's still growing. It's just growing yes. less this year than it was yes. last year. So it's, it's a falling amount of growth. But uh, we actually have contraction when it goes below the zero line, which has only happened one other time after the global financial crisis. And now today, <laughs> this is the biggest red flag that I've seen for the economy in all of these charts so far. Hi, everyone. I've got Ronnie Storferle from Incrementum AG with me once again. Ronnie, how are you doing? Mike, pleasure to see you. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, well, it's great seeing you again. Uh, you just sent me your latest chart book from the In Gold We Trust report. And so I wanted to go through some of these and get some uh, some feedback from you on these char charts. So maybe you can narrate them. But uh, this is the beginning of the first section, showdown, monetary policy, geopolitics, and gold. So read this quote for us. Yeah, well, it's it's by Mohammed El Arian, who, who used to work at, at PIMCO next to, to Bill Gross. And he said, the characterization of inflation as transitory is probably the worst inflation call in the history of the Federal Reserve. And it results in a high probability of a policy mistake. Now, I don't know if it's if it's really um, the worst inflation call in the history of the Federal Reserve. There have been many, many really poor ones. But I think it's important that also such, you know, um, um, very well renowned um, uh, market commentators uh, 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 really, really see that that the policy mistake has been made. And from my point of right. view, um, you know, the, all this soft landing and uh, a higher for longer and Goldilocks scenario, I just don't buy into that. And it seems that El Arian doesn't believe in it either. I don't believe in it either. And, you know, I think that uh, what that points to is that the people running things are clueless, basically. Uh, and then I've got this joke that I've been sort of uh, repeating lately. Uh, transitory inflation is like having two weeks to flatten the curve. Now, that may, may, may have not been a saying in Europe, but at the beginning of the pandemic, they needed two weeks to flatten yeah. the curve. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, uh, let's take a look at the first chart here. So we've got uh, interest rates and uh, let me see, key interest rates and CPI. So inflation. Uh, tell us about this chart behind yeah, well the curve. We said it's it's the definition of being behind the curve. Um, uh, so so I, you know, Mike, I, I just don't see why. <laughs> if you if you follow the track record of the Federal Reserve, I mean, what actually did they yeah, get? I do. That's exactly what I do. Is I try and follow their track record. <laughs> so so how do people now believe that they got it right? It doesn't really make right. any. <coughs> Sorry doesn't really make any sense so you know let's 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 jump back a couple of quarters and um, I think it's important to emphasize that throughout the year 2020 the year 2021 and up until spring 2022 Federal Reserve and the ECB kept telling us well actually it's only transitory uh, Madame Lagarde said it's only a hump uh, so uh, it, 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 uh, inflation will fall off the cliff again. Then, of course, it was only Mr. Putin being responsible for, for the inflation. Oh, yeah. And then that. Point, inflation. <laughs> in, 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 in spring, they hit the panic button and they started one of the most aggressive rate hike cycles uh, of the last couple of decades. And, and I think, you know, we put out a special paper, um, which was called The Boy Who Cried Wolf. And in fall 2020, we said, well, actually, now is the time to cautiously and slowly hike interest rates again, to cautiously take the liquidity out of the system again, um, for fiscal policy to become less aggressive again. Obviously, Federal Reserve and ECB didn't read that paper. Um, so it was to us it was pretty obvious that inflation was was becoming a real concern um and now you know they've been way behind the curve now from my point of view it's crystal clear that 
um, we're moving into recession. Actually, uh, all G7 nations are already very much late cycle. Some of them are already in a recession. Um, so I just don't see why the market still believes in this soft landing narrative. Um, I think we're in for a, for a, for a hell of a ride and a pretty <laughs> pretty yeah. pretty pretty deep recession, obviously. There's a couple of things that I see here, and one of them is first of all, the, you know, they raised rates to crush inflation. Where where did the inflation came from? It came from these people, the people that you're looking at right in this chart, those pictures there, <laughs> Christine Lagarde, Jerome Powell. It came from monetary inflation of the currency supply. And that caused the uh, rising prices later, the devaluation of the currency against goods and services. Uh, this inflation is by no means over with. They've slowed it down with these higher interest rates, but the, it hasn't, the, the rising prices have not yet sucked up all the excess currency that they created during the pandemic. So this is their fault. And then they're mopping up the mess by, that they created by creating a whole bunch of pain for the public uh, and potentially uh, breaking the world economy going forward. The other thing I see here that, you know, we're going to see a, a chart later in your book here. Uh, you've got the recession bars. There's two things I see. Uh, you can see the interest rates rise uh, in the United States. And then we start cutting just a little bit before the recession bar happens. Uh, the ECB cuts just a little bit later. The recession is so the rise in rates and the cutting in rates, both the ECB sort of follows the Fed. They're yes. a little bit later. But uh, you've got another one, I think, going back into the 70s. And I've got the same chart. It's a Fed funds rate, I think, or something like that uh, later on that we're going to visit. And what you see is that they raise rates until they cause a recession. <laughs> After they have caused the recession, then they lower rates again. <laughs> and of it's course, uh, they never blame themselves. But, but exactly. Mike, one thing that I would like to add, I think it's, it's, it's not only central bankers that are responsible for the inflation that we're seeing now. We have also seen a tremendous amount of fiscal stimulus. And I think that was really, really... Um, that was born in the 2020 um, uh, pandemic, actually. And I think that yeah. uh, politicians actually, you know, they, they, they enjoy themselves, you know, handing out, you know, uh, government checks and, 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 and well, paying a lot of, off. a lot of that fiscal think... stimulus came right from the federal reserve though, where uh, they were creating currency, giving it to the treasury and the treasury was mailing it to people. Yeah. <laughs> what did they expect would happen? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, moving on, uh, we've got Jay Powell. Uh, is he the new Paul Volcker? Uh, you know, uh, tell us a, a little bit about this and then the uh, background that was happening. And, you know, uh, you, if you do this again in your next uh, um, report, it's still going to look like this, the chart. But I would like to see this as a percentage of GDP. Uh, yes. Because between Volcker and Powell, was uh, was uh, Alan Greenspan, Ben Bernanke, and Janet Yellen, and they all inflated the currency supply. So it's a different dollar. Uh, this is 1980 and 2022 is sort of comparing the U.S. dollar to the Zimbabwe dollar. <laughs> now, if you inflation adjust it, it'll be like comparing the U.S. dollar to the Argentine peso. <laughs> it won't be quite as as great an inflation, uh, but we are seeing, you know, the the uh, 71 trillion uh, that we've got there in the total credit of non-financial sector uh, is um, uh, that is not an inflation adjusted fi figure or uh, as a percentage of GDP. Yes. So um, anyway, but tell us about it. It's a fascinating chart, especially when you look at uh, total credit of the non-financial sector. I mean, Mike, um, we, we know that trust is basically the, the foundation of our, you know, of, of our societies and, and therefore also of uh, uh, the financial world. And, you know, um, somebody once said that um, fiat money is like a religion and central bankers are the 
the high priests of this religion. And, you know, um, as central bankers got the inflation call so wrong, um, I think the, the Federal Reserve and central banks in general have lost an enormous amount of credibility. Um, and therefore, I, I think we have to give Jay Powell some credit for, you know, um, for, for, for kind of regaining some, 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 some credit. Because to be honest, uh, I don't know any analyst, market strategist, fund manager or, or even astrologist who actually forecasted that the Federal Reserve would raise interest rates um, by more than 5%. So, so I have to give Jay, Jay Powell credit for that. However, um, I always said that, you know, his, his references to Paul Foker, and I think this was really well played and there was a strategy behind that, but he was referring to, to, to Paul Foker in all of his speeches, especially uh, at the Jackson Hole speech, he was referring to this book called um, uh, Keeping at It. And, you know, he wanted to promote himself as a Jay Powell, uh, as a Paul Foker 2.0. But from my point of view, first of all, I said he, he should be nominated for the Academy Awards. And I, I also once said, <laughs> if, if Jay Powell is the new Paul Foker, then Danny DeVito is the new Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, you know, it's just, you know, the numbers just don't add up. And you can see it on, on, on this chart, actually, that mm -hmm. for, for Paul Foker back in the days, um, raising interest rates um, was definitely easier than for, for Jay Powell now because the level of debt, the level of, um, 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 of financialization of our world is just yes. so much bigger that the consequences of raising rates um, are uh, by magnitudes larger than when Paul Foker was around. And I think just one more thing, we should not forget that Paul Foker had the full support by the White House. So, so actually, I'm not so sure if a recession should um, hit the United States, especially in an election year, 2024, if Jay Powell will still have the full support by the White House. I, I kind of doubt that. So therefore, I think this comparison, Jay Powell is the new Paul Foker. I don't believe into that. I don't either. Uh, one of the things, you know, uh, while you were speaking, I, I just divided uh, the eight trillion on the uh, Fed's balance sheet today by the 0 0.16. <laughs> it's 50 times larger where the non-financial sector has only grown by a factor of 17. Yeah. Uh, so the Fed's balance sheet grew by a factor of 50. Unbelievable. Now, those are, like I said, are nominal figures. They're not adjusted for GDP or inflation. Yeah. But um, uh, yeah, uh, no, he, you're, you are absolutely correct. He is not the new <laughs> Paul Volcker. And another thing, when Paul Volcker took over, he was raising rates uh, starting at a base of about 8% or so, not from, uh, you know, one-tenth of 1%. 1 so the magnitude of the year-over-year -year change in rates uh, when uh, Powell did it, I, th I just thought it was reckless, the aggressiveness that he went after it. I thought that they had already backed themselves into a corner by creating so much currency, but they uh, really should have decided, you know what, we're going to have to tolerate some mm -hmm. inflation for it. We can't just try stamping it out immediately. We've got to tolerate it for, and it would have been very painful for every, everybody. And it leads to this upward spiral because wages are less. Everybody's got to ask for a raise that makes stuff cost more. And then make it when it wants to cost stuff costs more, it's like your wages are less. You got to ask for a raise again. <laughs> and so, um, uh, <clears throat> it's, it's a trap that they got themselves into. But the only way out of it is to eventually allow the currency supply to cover the amount of goods and services in the society and people's demand. And, uh, and, that, and, and without breaking the economy, they've already started the first leg of the financial crisis with uh, Silicon Valley, you know, the uh, banking crisis in March. Um, but, and and I, th I think that was just like a warning shot and that the worst is yet to come. So um, 
This is exactly what I was talking about and exactly what you were talking about, the aggressiveness of their uh, the rate change. So uh, tell us about this. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, 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 it's just interesting to see how um, how um, how aggressive this 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 move has been already. And it's you know, it's it's a little bit like um, if you if you're driving, you know, on the highway, perhaps, you uh, you know, way way too fast, um, and if there's if there's something you know um, you know uh, that, that that you're seeing uh, lying on the on, on on the highway, you can of course you can ignore it and say, well, it isn't there. Let's say a tire or, or a car that broke down, or you could say, well, actually there is something. Slow down, change lanes, and then deal with the problem. And and actually, you know, just. Uh, drive past it but central bankers have as i've said they have completely ignored the surge in inflation and and the stickiness of inflation that they have created so they had to step you know on the on the brakes they had to step very very hard on the brakes and now we're seeing the consequences yeah. however i think that i i am kind of astonished that it's taken longer than expected i would have expected the recession to hit already earlier However, we should not forget that, you know, the U.S., for example, is running a budget deficit of more than 8%, uh, even though on paper it has full employment. So I don't know whether budget deficit is going to be once we hit the recession. Um, right, so and the employment numbers are fudged. They, they are probably. So, so this, in combination with, uh, you know, some, some, some one-off effects, clearly have um, delayed the recession. But from my point of view, it, it, it's going to happen. And, and the longer that um, that the Federal Reserve remains confident that, you know, they can continue. I mean, now they are kind of pausing, but but for December, it's still it's still in the cards. But the damage has already been done. So this chart is the number of months since they started the rate height cycle. And then you've got the percentage of change on the side. And it makes it look like the 83, 84 uh, change was just huge in a very short period of time. But I just want to remind everybody that the current rate cycle that's now 18 months old started at a base of a tenth of a percent, where that rate, si rate hike cycle uh, in 83, I believe, started at uh, um, about 7% or 8%. Uh, and took it up to 18 in a very short period of time. So the rate of change, even though that red line looks like the most aggressive, it actually wasn't. The most aggressive was the black line. So the, the current tightening cycle. Yeah. So let's move on to the next one. And here's the one where I was talking about, you know, I've got this going back to uh, 1947. And you can see here that they raise rates until they cause a recession. <laughs> the, the, the rates stop going up once they sense that a recession is coming. And you can see that sometimes they know that they've overdone it and they start cutting uh, and then the recession hits because of some crisis. And you've got all the crises marked out here. So what's your comments on this? Well, I mean, it's <laughs> it's. It's the same old, uh, you know, uh, uh, cycle all over again. It's classic boom-bust cycles uh, caused by, by central bank actions. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, many people say, well, so far, nothing, hasn't, nothing has happened. Um, I would disagree. I mean, just have a look what's, what's going on in the bond market. I mean, we're, right. we're coming from really microscopic lows in yields in 2020, and, and, and now treasuries with with maturities of, of, of 10 years or more in, during that time have plunged 46% in value. The long bond is down 53% in total return terms. And this is the foundation of most portfolios. So what we're seeing now in the bond market, it is actually rivaling the, the worst bear markets ever recorded for the S&P 500. Uh, so uh, I think it was... 57 or 56 percent during the great financial crisis this was what we're seeing now in the bond markets so um therefore i i, I just 
don't see why so many people are still so so complacent. And when I talk to people from, I don't know, real estate development, also private equity, um, those uh, rather illiquid investment uh, uh, pockets of the market, I mean, uh, it's 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 utter chaos what we're seeing there. So um, you know, it's it's it, even if the Federal Reserve would start lowering now. The damage has already been done, and I think those time lags. There, there. Uh, I once called it. Uh, I think we, we we talked about that the tequila theory of money, that it takes some time for the for the effect to kick in, like with having tequila shots. Uh -huh. I think you know, um, it's on the upside, but it's also on the way down. So even if they start lowering rates, it will take a couple of months, a couple of quarters for these uh, um, uh, lower rates to really materialize. And as I've said, the damage has already been done. Uh, I do want to point out to everybody, uh, in that last chart, we showed that big rate rise that uh, was 1980 to 82 or whatever, that happened very, very quickly. That's this one, but you're coming off of a base here of more than 8%, taking it to above 18%. So the magnitude of the change in interest rates wasn't nearly as as much as going from a tenth of a percent up to uh, four and a quarter or whatever whatever it is now i can't remember four and a half um and so let's move on to the next one here uh <laughs> i love the photos hi i just wanted to take a moment and thank you for subscribing and mention that if you'd like to help our channel Please consider my company, goldsilver.com, the next time you buy precious metals. We're one of the most trusted names in the industry. Our prices are sharp, delivery is fast, and we have an insider's program where you find out exactly what I'm doing with my own investments. Thanks for making goldsilver.com your dealer. And now, back to the video. <laughs> I love the photos. And um, so we've got, uh, this is base currency, right? Yes. And uh, you've got the projected tightening, the supposed, remember when Ben Bernanke said that he was absolutely 100% confident that we could normalize the balance sheet. <laughs> These are the kind of people that are running things. They have, they're, they're super smart and they're so smart that they have an overconfidence in themselves. They're absolutely positive of something and they don't think that they can possibly be wrong. So when they do make a mistake, it's huge and it costs all of us so much. So um, tell us about the tightening and <laughs> gradually removing the oxygen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's we, we shouldn't forget, Mike, that it's, it's, it's not only... Um, interest rates that have uh, uh, that have risen dramatically over the last couple of months, it is also quantitative tightening. So they actually want to reduce the balance sheet by, by, by more than a trillion this year. I mean, we have already seen during the SVB crisis that I think three or 400 billion were added to the balance sheet quite quickly. Um, but still, um, the Fed seems really convinced that they can proceed with quantitative tightening. Somebody today, I think, said that they will go down to, to two trillion in the balance sheet. I mean, that's that's probably the joke of the decade. Um, but if you look at the track record when it comes to quantitative tightening um, and the projects projections that they've made, well, actually, um, you know, we have only seen some quantitative tightening, but then at some point something happened and they had to increase. The balance sheet they had to do new rounds of quantitative easing again so i said it is like that that that's my analogy it's like if you're slowly but gradually removing oxygen from a ballroom full of investors and at the beginning perhaps you you don't really realize it and you don't feel it but then but then the weakest uh in the room they start feeling it and then you know uh, it, it, the collapse starts actually so I don't believe that that they will continue, that they will be able to continue with quantitative tightening um, uh, much longer. But this is adding to this tightening. And I think what we shouldn't, shouldn't forget either is 
The third part of the tightening is the strength of the US dollar recently. Um, so the dollar was the dollar index was trading at I think a hundred uh, in July, and now we're trading around 106, 107. That's an additional tightening that we're seeing in the market. Mm -hmm. So rise, rising rates, quantitative tightening, and a strong dollar, that's that's a pretty dangerous uh, um, uh, setup that we're seeing. Yeah, you know, I just want to show remind everybody here, if you look at the uh, legend across the bottom, you've got the projection for 2010, the proje projection for 2011, projection for 2012, 13. 18 and 22 and so these are the experts projected this is this is what they say and plan on happening is those lines that you have added to the graph and then what ends up happening is the exact opposite of what <laughs> these brilliant minds have planned for us and then if you look right after qe4 you've got the gold line and uh, you were talking about the Silicon Valley financial, you know, the, the banking crisis. That little jag in the blue line is that extra, uh, those billions that you, how many billion were, did you say that was? That they injected when with- uh, I think three or 400 billion. Yeah, so that's what that little jag is uh, uh, right after QE4. Anyway, so let's move on to the next one. I'm just amazed how these people, continually get it wrong, yet they still think that they're masters of the unit financial universe. So this is an interesting chart. So yeah, well, it shows the, the tightening that we're seeing from um, in the banking system. And, 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 and I think what's what's really, really going on is that it's kind of a, a brewing storm or, or yeah, or, or hurricane or whatever for the consumer. And let's not forget that oil is up more than 30 percent in the last three months that as i've said 10 years are up significantly the two years are up significantly of course of course mortgage rates are up significantly um but then we're also seeing that that households are slowly but surely running out of excess savings we're seeing that all those student loan uh, um, uh payments and they they they, they are restarting uh, since the beginning of october we're seeing that um, now, slowly, delinquency rates uh, for credit cards and for auto loans are, are, are rising again. We're uh -huh. seeing that, uh, I mean, that's, that's not on this chart, but I think it's really important to, 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 to emphasize is that China is struggling big time. And in the oh, previous, yeah. let's say, during the great financial crisis, actually, this enormous amount of stimulus coming out of China, this actually saved the Western world, from my point of view, to a large degree. But now China is also uh, uh, in a very, very weak spot. So so therefore, I think, you know, all those uh, uh, indicators are clearly showing me that that we are moving into a recession. I think we've got it on the on the next chart as well, where we see negative okay. bank credit growth. Um, negative I bank credit growth before recession is a big red flag. Now, I want to point out that um, in, in most of these cycles, negative growth means it's still growing. It's just growing yes. less this year than it was yes. last year. So it's, it's a falling amount of growth. But uh, we actually have contraction when it goes below the zero line, which has only happened one other time after the global financial crisis. And now today, <laughs> this is the biggest red flag that I've seen for the economy in all of these charts so far. Uh, when when uh, credit growth is actually contracting because we have a monetary system that relies on credit expansion or the whole thing goes into a deflationary implosion. When you borrow every dollar that exists into existence and you promise to pay it back with interest, you have to go deeper into debt tomorrow to borrow the currency to pay the interest, but yes. you're promising to pay that back with interest. And so the, the, the amount of debt and credit always has to expand under a national fiat monetary system. And here we have the central banker's worst nightmare, credit contraction. So uh, tell us about, uh, about this. What's your take on it? Yeah, well, I mean, you, 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 you summed it up perfectly. I mean, you, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're commenting our charts really, really well. Uh, thanks, well, thanks for that. 
these are really important charts. I've never seen this one before. It's excellent. I, I commend you. For Thanks. It. Thanks, Mike. I, I mean, it's it's for me, it's 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 such things are, are pretty obvious. And, 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 you know, in our credit based system, we actually need credit growth and we, we always need higher uh, uh, growth actually to, 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 to achieve a uh, uh, um, uh, growth. But now as it's, 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 it's really, it's below the zero line and, and also the momentum, yeah. the momentum really falling off a cliff. This is for me, that, that's a pretty obvious sign that, um, that we are moving at least into a recession. And, and you know, uh, I don't know, I think it was, it was Dave Rosenberg who, who said recently, every recession starts out looking like a soft landing. So <laughs> I, I couldn't agree more and I don't know, uh, you know, too many analysts on Wall Street actually forecasting a, a nasty recession. But if you have a look at those charts, from my point of view, it's, it, it is really, really obvious. Perhaps I'm wrong. Um, I think you're absolutely right. You know, a recession is a trailing indicator. You don't find out that you're you're that a recession is happening until you've been in it for six months. Exactly. You have yeah. to have what is it? Two consecutive quarters of GDP contraction is the official. There's, there's well, several different uh, uh, measurements, but you it when when they announce that we're in a recession, it started at least six months ago, maybe a year ago. Yes. It, yeah. And so I believe, that, and this chart, I think, really shows it, that uh, a recession started early, you know, at least three months ago, if not six or nine months ago. Uh, I've been noticing a slowdown at the local restaurants, mostly midweek. They're still busy on the weekends, but mm -hmm. midweek, especially higher-end restaurants where they're, uh, it's, um, uh, I don't know, they're just... Um, uh, I was at a restaurant that should have been, you know, at least half full. And I, my business associate and I were the only ones there uh, for two hours from seven, from uh, 5.30 to 7.30, when there should have been 20, 30 people on this rooftop, you know, uh, enjoying food and, and drink. And uh, we had a couple of hamburgers, a, a couple of beers. The bill was a hundred bucks. I put $20 on the credit card and then walking out, I noticed there's one bartender, one waiter and no other customers, but us for that full two hours. And when you take into account the special minimum wage that they've got mm -hmm. for uh, service sector employees, tipped employees, uh, those guys in, in two hours, they each made, uh, I think it was $4 and 30 cents for the two hours. So anyway, let's move on to the next chart here. I, th I think that one was very alarming. So uh, this is very concerning, too, because we're just going into a different era. Tell us about it. Well, it shows the, the, the share of U.S. imports and exports to and from China. Um, and it clearly seems that um, the relationship between um, the U.S. and China is, is not very good. Uh, right. And it has it has weakened uh, 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 or deteriorated uh, uh, significantly over the last couple of um, over the last couple of, 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 of quarters. Um, and I have, you know, I was with with my family in in, in Florida over summer. Um, yes, it was very hot. It was very humid, but we had a good time. And I, I talked to a couple of people, and, and and everybody said, well, actually. For the upcoming elections, uh, we're voting for Trump because we need a strong man um, to fight against our enemies, and our enemies are China and Russia. So, so from my point of view, this whole, um, you know, this whole deglobalization topic um, is, is is clearly happening. We're we're also seeing it with the with the BRICS now. Um, it's like the little brother who is becoming more self-confident who actually um is kind of not taken serious by by the big brother um yeah. but actually it's it's you know it's 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 catching up pretty quickly and and therefore i think that when it comes to when it comes to gold uh we had a large chapter about the the gold flows in our um lasting gold we trust report where we said actually um gold flows um into emerging markets at the moment. So just one number, 
Over the last 20 years, 35,000 tons of physical gold were imported by China and India. And it's not coming back. It's a one-way street. And we shouldn't forget, this is just imports. And then China nowadays is also the largest producer of gold. And from my point of view, there's probably also, you know, they're sourcing from, from Hong Kong, from, 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 from other countries. So probably the number is even bigger. So does gold play a major role in this whole deglobalization? Um, perhaps we're kind of overemphasizing the role of gold, but I think it is definitely playing a role. Uh, and as we're seeing now with, you know, uh, U.S. Treasury, what, what, what's going on in, in the bond market, it is pretty obvious that the marginal buyer isn't around anymore. And the China prefers, you know, making deals with uh, other BRICS countries, um, prefers um, doing infrastructure investments, um, that even the Saudis are, are kind of uh, becoming um, closer with uh with china so so i think this is a it is a somewhat frightening development that we're seeing it's it's this kind of fourth turning um environment and uh yeah i think this is it has already started way earlier but now it's really um getting very very apparent yes uh you know one thing i see that's very interesting on this chart i don't remember exactly what was happening uh but during the trump era uh back in about 20 18, end of 2018 or in 2019, uh, the um, exports, U.S. exports to China took that huge dip going into it, it bottomed uh, in the, uh, the pandemic recession in yes. 2020. Yes. But it was already falling well before that. Yeah. So it wasn't caused by recession. And the same thing with uh, Chinese imports from the U.S. So global... Uh, trade was slowing down at that time, but this is a bad trend for all of us. Uh, so a new era, era of deglobalization has, has only begun. So this reflects on the last chart and I believe on the upcoming chart as well. But you've got this brilliantly separated into uh, different eras. And, uh, you know, people, if you look at some of the Quotes like there's a John Maynard Keynes quote from uh, uh, that before World War One, before the uh, great sorrows of the world, I think he called them uh, that. Um, and he was talking about a man in London could, uh, you know, sit sipping his tea, reading the newspaper and pick up the phone and invest in any lands of the earth that he wanted. And, and they, you know, basically the international trade was mm -hmm. free. They could travel the earth without having to go through all of these uh, customs and passports and, and uh, you know, having some guy try to intimidate you as yes. you're entering some other country. Uh, and you can see that industrialization. And one of the things that I get from this chart that I think is amazing, you see where World War I caused this, and the protectionism caused this huge contraction. And then after World War II, uh, we've got the expansion of the Bretton Woods system and then uh, liberalization. And then you've got, instead of globalization, slobalization. <laughs> I've never heard that great uh, uh, saying there. But what I see from it is that mankind keeps on shooting themselves in the foot because we're following all of these psychopaths, these bullies, these uh, the, the people, the leaders are either like children bullies, criminals, uh, 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 power-hungry psychopaths. And if you take the growth of that first blue section industrialization, and if you had just taken that trend of Bretton Woods and, and liberalization and continued that on the chart without these huge pullbacks, where we would be with our prosperity today is just mind-boggling. I can't imagine the level of, uh, of, you know, our level of existence, our level, if, if we hadn't kept on shooting ourselves in the foot and following these people. Uh, and so uh, do you have any comments on this chart? I, I, so, I'm sorry I 
<laughs> went on like that. But uh, no, I no. something amazing in this chart because you've broken it up into these proper sections of what was happening politically, uh, geopolitically at the time. I, I think that, you know, if, if we want to, to summarize it, I would say that, that, that liberty and capitalism are now in intensive care. Um, and that's something that's, that's, that's very, very frightening. And yes. um, I think Bastia said, if, if goods don't cross borders, soldiers will. Uh, and this is actually yeah. that um, that is clearly happening, and 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 you know um, this protectionism that we're seeing all over the globe. Um, this is a trend, and 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 I kind of fear that this is really a secular trend that will right. continue for a while. And and you know when I heard um, after the COVID crisis about this, uh, you know nearshoring and French shoring and all those terms came up, I said, well, this is inflationary because we can. We can produce the stuff uh, here in Europe, uh, but it's going to be very, very costly. And we just don't have the workforce right. for that. We don't have the capital structure for that. Um, but it is a trend. And I, and I fear that it's going to continue at least for, for a couple of more years. Yeah, what I see is that we're just we're doing the same. Humanity is doing the same setback to itself that it did from uh, 1913. Uh, to the end of World War II. And uh, this is not, you can't go back in time and repair transactions that didn't happen, repair mm -hmm. trade that didn't happen. So you can never catch up to where you could have possibly been. You know, my point with uh, what I was saying before, if you projected the growth from that original industrialization area and uh, lifted the Bretton Woods and the liberalization, the blue areas that you've got, up to match that uh let me see do i yeah up to match that growth so it was just one continuous line our prosperity would be right off the top of this chart mm -hmm. we'd be mm -hmm. living 20 years longer i mean uh this affects everybody it affects our lifestyles it affects your children and we're allowing these global leaders to do this again it reminds me of that saying about uh cycles that uh good times create weak men, weak men create bad times, bad times create good men, good men create uh, good times. And we're seeing this cycle play out in this chart. So uh, this is going to be the last one of uh, this series. But you, you, you mentioned uh, the BRICS countries. And uh, here you have that uh, global balance of power changing. So uh, Tell us about this because it's pretty dramatic what is happening. Yeah, as I've said, it's 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 like the the, the small brother uh, growing up, and it's not really taken taken serious yet. But if we have a look at this chart, which shows the share of global GDP in purchasing power parity um, from the G7 nations and the BRICS, well, actually, um, the BRICS have have already taken over um, from from the G7. And now with the with the latest addition um, uh, to the BRICS, so six new members are being welcomed starting in 2024. And those countries are, I would say, from a geopolitical or geostrategic point of view, they're pretty, pretty important countries. Argentina, Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. Um, actually, they are responsible for 50 percent. Uh, of, of global oil exports now, the BRICS nations. So um, it is something that, that, that should be taken seriously. Um, on the other hand, I think, you know, um, it, it was slightly overestimated. Uh, it was like in the, uh, during summer when the Russian embassy in Kenya tweeted out that they will uh, announce a gold-backed BRICS currency uh, at the upcoming summit. Uh, and I, I thought, well, this is probably the intern that is uh, slightly bored or, or perhaps he's a bit drunk and he's just tweeting stuff out. Um, but it was like a big, big thing. Uh, however, I think, you know, those things, um, establishing a new trade currency and even more so a new reserve currency, that's a pretty big project. I mean, it. Uh, it took the world uh, uh, more than 30 years to establish the euro. 
um, and it wasn't quite successful. And, and my take is that we're seeing more of a de-euroization than a de-dollarization, actually. Um, however, we're seeing that, you know, the BRICs, um, they've got common interests. On the other hand, they are also, you know, they're pretty, pretty diverse a um, uh, 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 combination of countries with, with China and India, for example. I mean, we know that they don't like each other too much. Um, but, but still, I think it is a development that should be followed. And the next meeting will be in Kazan in Russia. Uh, and uh, right, on, right on top of the agenda is basically a new settlement system and a new currency system. So I think this is they're working on it. But... You know the infrastructure um, for such a project. That's it's a very very complex task. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think that's going to wrap up uh, this section, and I want to let everybody know that this was about the economy and global trends. Uh, so you know, currency supply and such. And the next section, we're going to see how gold interacts with that. And uh, so, please join us in the in the next video with Ronnie. Ronnie, I want to thank you so much for taking us through these very, very important charts. Can you tell them where they can get a copy of your chart book? Absolutely. Mike, thanks for having me again. Um, <laughs> I love the fact that you you understand and you you interpret our charts so well. I mean, it's, 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 it's really uh, it's a great pleasure for me. Um, well, if you want to learn more about our work, um, we're an asset management company based in Liechtenstein. Uh, it's incrementum.li. We manage six funds um, and the In Gold We Trust report um, is, is our benchmark publications. It has one big report coming out uh, every year in spring. And then we've got uh, 12 monthly chart books on gold. That's the monthly gold compass. And then we've got two special chart books like like this one that we that we've talked about, and this is all available totally for free. You don't have to register or anything. Just download it on our webpage, ingoldwetrust.report. Excellent. I want to thank, thank you. you very much for walking us through that, and I want to thank the audience for watching. And so we'll see you later, Ronnie. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. See you soon. Bye. Hi, I just wanted to tell you about Gold Silver's 111 ounce silver giveaway where you can win, 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 one, one, one. One one ounce silver bar, one 10 ounce silver bar, and one 100 ounce silver bar. So enter today and win.